Hello and welcome to our Lee Enterprise podcast. I'm meteorologist Kirsten Lang. This is Across the Sky, our national podcast that we have with our four affiliates across, our four meteorologists, I should say, across the country. We have Sean Sublet, who is in Richmond, Virginia, Matt Polliner, who is in the Chicago area. And then typically we have Joe Martucci also, who is in Atlantic City, but he is off deserve um, off on vacation, some well-deserved vacation uh, today. So it's the three of us. And, uh, you know, we have brought on Grady, uh, goodness, Grady McGahan. You got it. Grady, we, we met you. We went to the AMS conference in Milwaukee and, and we met you because you had just a phenomenal speech. Grady is with Retreat. It was something that he had built back in 2010 and then recently a year and a half ago merged with keep america beautiful and when we heard grady's speech all three of us just were looking at each other we're like man this guy is so cool and what he's doing is just so so neat we've got to talk with him more and he's redefining disaster relief through the community and we really you know we wanted to talk with him a little bit more about what it is that he he is doing so with that uh you know grady welcome i hope you're doing well you're in dallas tell us a little bit about dallas how's that going right now uh, Dallas is hot and dry at the moment, like many areas in the South and Midwest, as I'm sure many of you are experiencing. I also want to take just a quick moment to thank you all for giving me the opportunity to, to come on the show here and continue telling the unique and distinctive story of Retreat, which, as you mentioned, is redefining disaster relief, specifically by replanting trees that have been lost to natural disaster and organizing communities around that work. Yeah, and like I said, what what uh, what we heard you talking about was so neat uh, because it impacts so many people here across the country. And so, you know, it's it's something where we have these disasters that come through, and so many trees can be lost uh, whenever that happens. Just go if you don't mind. Tell us a little bit more about your project and what it is that you do. Yeah, so retreat is really. It's a program of Keep America Beautiful now, and it's based around a pretty simple concept. And that's that when a natural disaster strikes a community, there are a lot of systems and mechanisms that click into to place to rebuild housing and infrastructure and reestablish the, the human constructed environment. But there's actually very little, if, if any resources available to rebuild the environment itself, itself around uh, you know, the human experience. So, while houses are going up and you know pipes are being laid and cars are being replaced, there, there, there typically is no one going about replanting all of the trees that were destroyed in the community, which of everything that's been lost, it's the trees that will take the longest to replace because you can't simply rebuild an 80 year old, year old oak tree. Um, you have to plant one and, and wait for 50 years. And that's a, it's a really hard emotional reality for most community members to confront the loss of the environmental identity of their community, but also the realization that the road to recovery is is very long. It's it's filled with with many, many, many things to do that require um, an an immense amount of resources. And along that road, the the replacement of the the trees that were destroyed is is something that's really towards the end um, and will typically uh, take longer than most people are, are going to live actually. And so when that work is not being attended to, when it's not being done, it's, it, it's really a continual reminder of the destruction of the natural disaster, no matter what it is, because all disasters destroy the trees. And even when you have brand new houses and brand new cars and you walk out of your, your front door every day and you look up and down the street and you see stumps, you don't hear any birds, you don't, you don't see anything that gives you um, any sort of sense of, of living beings it's a really hard reality to face. And so I identified that need and tied it to what I believe also is the need, especially of current and future generations to get involved in environmental rehabilitation and disaster relief specifically to, to have some kind of hands-on experience, want to do something. But most people lack certification or a specific skill set or really the necessary resources outside of the expertise to Um, step into the immediate relief following a disaster and and help. Uh, So it's a matter of, instead of losing that potential, all that human potential, directing it to the needs of the long-term recovery process and telling folks, if you don't have any particular skills, if you need to make time at your job and and, you you wanna come down and help a community recover, a way that you can do that is by 
showing up to help plant trees, you know, six months, a year, two, three, four years, even after the disaster and make an investment in these communities through your time, um, your labor, and maybe some of your financial resources. Uh, because as you plant a tree in a community, every year it grows, every year it becomes more valuable. And again, that, that really is an investment in a, in a community. So it was, it was really about, as a program, Retreat really is about connecting those two needs, the need and desire of people to help with the need that exists in the long-term recovery, specifically around environmental rehabilitation within communities. And we, we're looking to standardize that process and making it part of the, um, the response to, to natural disaster as a whole. And that really is also the reason behind the merger of Retreat and Keep America Beautiful. Hey, Grady, Sean Sublett uh, in Richmond. One of the things that I'd like you to, to bring forward, because I think this is kind of the motivating reason for, for getting you on here, the connection to environmental, in this case, weather disasters, the story that you shared with everybody from what happened in Dayton, Ohio, a while back, I think that's a good prototype to explain what the organization does, how it truly helps. Because as you just alluded to, you can't put up a whole forest in, in a week. You know, it, it takes time to, to plant trees and then they have to grow. It takes a very, very long time. So can you, as briefly as you can, uh, give a synopsis of how your organization helped in the wake of the tornado outbreak in Dayton. And just for, for those not familiar, massive, massive tornado outbreak uh, in Dayton, Ohio. Tremendous amounts of damage to homes, communities, businesses, and obviously to the natural environment as well. So Grady, in, in, in the wake of that, how did your organization come back in to help? I will do my best to be brief. That goes against uh, my passion, which you know like allows me to fuse about this subject for quite a long period of time, but using Dayton as a case study, as an example of the need. And the reason why we say we're redefining disaster relief is because this is not something that is being thought of by the general public. It's something that only crops up in a population that is living through the relief and recovery process following a natural disaster. So in Dayton specifically, um, a local member of the Allwood Audubon reached out to retreat having done a search online for resources to help replant trees in the aftermath of disaster. And because we have become the national authority in that work, we were the first thing that appeared as a resource. They reached out to us. Uh, we asked a series of questions that allows us to begin establishing the partnerships that we need locally on the ground to bring the program to bear in a community. And that really is the first step is gathering all of the local partners because we don't step in as a massive organization and, and dictate how everything's gonna be and, and pour in human resources. We're much more of an organizing force that connects local groups to each other and then also to state, regional and national, national resources along with the guidance needed to put on a project like this. So we working in partnership with all these local groups created the Miami Valley Tree Covery Campaign which was in response to the, the largest, uh, most devastating outbreak of tornadoes in Ohio state history. Sorry, yes, in, in Ohio state history. And that occurred in Memorial Day of 2019 when those tornadoes came through. And so our goal was to replant, it still is actually, we're still doing work on the ground there, is to replant a thousand trees. These are all 15 gallons in size. So that's eight to 10 feet tall, typically at five, to um, 600 home sites throughout the Miami Valley. So that's along a tornado path that spans a, you know, many miles and impacts a lot of jurisdictions in that area. It's not just Dayton, it's all these surrounding communities. So it really involves a lot of interjurisdictional you know, cooperation. And again, various partnerships uh, with sponsors and other groups like the Ohio Chapter International Society of Aboriculture that we pull into the process. So the first thing we do is we reach out to the community we find out who needs help. We create an intake form through which residents are able to request trees. Then we, we then divide all of those requests up into uh, geographically approximate groups so that we get a handle of the workload, what the geographic boundaries of each event we're gonna put on will be. And then we start organizing the individual plantings, typically on a four to six month rotation. So we'll have a major event every four to six months. An event will look like 200 or so volunteers gathering on a day to be trained in how to properly 
plant trees and then being broken up into smaller groups, each of which will visit a specific number of homes, typically um, eight or so homes where they'll plant two trees each. And so over the course of five hours on a retreat planting day, we'll put about 200 trees in the ground. So extrapolating those numbers out, we're looking at doing about five major events or, or, or potentially four with some smaller ones um, peppered amongst them in, in the Miami Valley area to, to meet that goal of a thousand trees planted. And when we plant those trees leading up to that, and you know there are, there are months of preparation that go into having that many trees be able to go into the ground within that short of a period of time. And that includes you know, having all the utilities marked, um, sending out an arborist to each home site to meet with the family, to discuss the trees that we're gonna have available from which they can choose, all of which have been sourced from a local wholesale nursery. So we're really making intelligent decisions about which trees are going where, and we're doing that alongside the family, informing them of the process and obviously taking their feedback. So all those decisions are made the groups go out and plant the trees. And at the end of planting day, we throw a big celebratory dinner for all the volunteers and the partners and the sponsor where they can rejoice and, and, and celebrate again all of the work that's been done to rebuild and now replant the community. And then it also imbues those trees as a result with something, it's like a special event. You know, people typically will, they will often plant trees when someone is born or when someone passes away, or they'll take a picture in front of a tree every year to show the growth of their family. So people tie moments to trees and by creating the celebratory dinner we do the same thing and we find that that actually increases our long-term survival rates because it becomes about those trees that were planted that day and not just a tree in my yard hey grady it's matt this is just a fascinating project to me and i want to go back to the beginning because i was going over your bio and one thing that really stood out to me was that in April of 2010, you went on an 18 month trip around the world and visited 25 countries and five continents. And then when you got back from that trip, that's when you founded Retreat. So what was that trip like? And what was it on that trip that inspired you to found Retreat? Very good question. I'm somebody who up to this point in my life has paid a lot of attention to the opportunities that come my way. And I step up to them. I think that they say half of, of success is just showing up, right? Taking that first step. So when I found out that there was an around the world plane ticket, that that existed and, and how much that was and, and you know, that I could afford it and, and was young enough to go out and have that adventure, I took the opportunity and I spent 18 months straight, basically traveling around the world, going to all, you know, I mean, many, many countries and really focused on input as opposed to output. I think we have, at least I do as a producer, you know, I, I, I branded the trip. I called it around the world in Grady days. And I was very determined to, to blog about it and post photos and everything else. And I met a traveler who told me, you need to really focus on everything that's going on around you and not so much on what you're trying to get out of it all the time and what you're going to use to justify it everyone back home as to why you took this trip. So I really started paying attention to everything that was happening around me. And I noticed the through line of what made people fulfilled, uh, which I believe is more important than happiness. I think people are tracing happiness a lot and that's you know, a temporary emotional state. Fulfillment is something much deeper. And you know, I wanted that for myself. And what I saw that no matter what the socioeconomic status was, uh, no matter what part of the world it was, generally speaking, what made people fulfilled was being a part of a healthy, robust, vibrant community, doing work that impacted that community positively and being respected and, and ideally loved for that, that work, being seen and having what you do matters, I, I think. At least for me, that was where I wanted to be. And so when I came back from that trip, I was looking for opportunities to do that. Uh, there were wildfires that had happened in Bastrop County, which is just outside of Austin at the time. And a group of friends, and I decided, uh, you know, as cyclists and arborists and kind of a, you know, the, the sort of group that you might imagine would come up with this idea that we, we should go down to this community and replant trees for folks there because they, a lot of them lived in that area specifically because it, it's heavily forested and the trees were central to that identity. And that was some, the trees were something that I had been involved with, which is a whole other story up to that point. And we created this event, let's go down and plant trees for these folks. And that event went so well and it was so well attended and engaged the community so strongly and created such emotional connection that the event became an organization. The organization I believe is becoming a movement and that's being made possible through the merger with Keep America Beautiful. 
Okay, we're going to take just a quick break. And uh, then on the back side of that, we'll come back and, uh, and ask you just a couple more uh, questions, if that's okay. And uh, again, you're watching or listening to rather Across the Sky podcast with Lee Enterprise Weather Group. Learning to swim is fun. British Swim School is welcoming all new students to start their journey in the world of water. The team of highly trained experts at British Swim School will show your little fish all the ins and outs of life in the water, while also sharing valuable knowledge on water safety. So is it time for your kids to get their feet wet? Sign them up now at BritishSwimSchool.com. That's BritishSwimSchool.com. British Swim School. Make a splash. All right, welcome back to Across the Sky podcast. I am Kirsten Lang, meteorologist with the Tulsa World. With me, we have Sean Sublet uh, with Richmond Times Dispatch and Matt Holliner in the Chicago area with many different, <laughs> many different publications. And you know, we have today with us uh, Grady McGann, and he is with uh, Keep America Beautiful and uh, Retreat, and just some great stuff here, Grady. We really enjoy talking with you because we think what you're doing is just fantastic. And you know, we were talking earlier, kind of about the background of it, and you know, Retreat started uh, a while back, but you just recently merged with Keep America Beautiful. And tell us a little bit about that merger and what that means going forward for the future of the uh, program. Well, over the years, as we perfected the program, and it's not perfect yet, of course, there's always room for growth. But as we as we really worked on honing the program as something that could be brought to community after community across North America, really, I started looking at the program essentially as an equation that had a result that we wanted. That's native trees planted in communities in the aftermath of natural disaster. But on the front end of that equation were a bunch of constants and variables. And you know, certain things are, are going to be the same every single place or non-negotiables, but the equation adapts for each community in which the program is brought in, into being. And one of those variables was that kind of became a constant. Similarly to whenever we go to a, a community, there's always a Home Depot there and we always need material from Home Depot. So we started off walking into Home Depots and asking them to make small donations. And that led to over time, a relationship with Home Depot Foundation at the national level that started granting funds pretty much every single project that we've put on since 2015. So similarly, as we kept coming into these communities, we kept finding affiliates of this organization called Keep America Beautiful. And because we had worked with so many affiliates before in other communities, much like the Home Depot, we were able to leverage that past success into future partnership with a new affiliate and point to this working relationship and say, hey, look, we've worked with Keep Indianapolis Beautiful and Keep More Beautiful and Keep This Beautiful and Keep That Beautiful. And here you are. This is how we do the program. And this is what we need uh, from you or how we would like you to plug into it. And so that naturally became kind of a first point of entry into any community. We started looking, is there a Keep America Beautiful affiliate here? Because we know how to work with them and we know how to make them central to the delivery of the program. And once that became the case, that gave me the opportunity to start speaking at the local and actually state level about the retreat program and how it was working alongside affiliates. And these are at you know, Keep Texas Beautiful's conference or um, at other similar venues. And eventually that caught the attention of Keep America Beautiful, the national organization. And we met, we had a you know, really great structured conversation about how we could partner at the national level uh, so that we didn't have to kind of reinvent the wheel every time, but that we could be co-delivering the program. That led to two years of um, you know, a signed memorandum of understanding that really put down in ink how we were going to work together and support each other. And at the conclusion of the second year of that MOU, the question started begging itself. And it was presented to me by the CEO of the organization, the America Beautiful, at that time. She asked what my plans were with retreat over, I guess, the course of my life, where I'd like to see it go. I explained all of that. And she said, well, instead of doing all of that, what if you merge the organization, if these two came together and Keep America Beautiful being the largest community improvement nonprofit in the United States with 700 affiliates across the country and growing, it was such a unique and incredible opportunity to scale the program to the exponential level at which it needs to be to address this, the amount of need that's out there, which is growing 
as these disasters become more prevalent and more destructive. And so we engaged in this process of, you know, going through the boards, really, I mean, it was, a, it was a, almost a two year long process of understanding what it would look like to merge, how we would do that, what the results of it would be, setting the intent, creating the understanding and going through those processes, which on the stroke of midnight between 2020 and 2021, January 1st, the two organizations uh, came together and became a single one retreat now being a new flagship program of Keep America Beautiful. And that whole process was actually funded by an organization based out of Dallas called the Better Together Fund, which, uh, which grants funds to organizations specifically looking at strategic partnerships and mergers. So we were really fortunate to present the idea to that group and have them see the, the inherent value in it and, and give us the, the money to go about executing that merger funnily enough, or maybe not so funny, uh, we received the first grant of that series of three grants that were issued um, just a couple of weeks before the, the COVID curtain fell. It was uh, you know, in, in late February of 2020 when we, when we got that, um, that grant. I'm sorry, of 2020, man, these years are just flying by on COVID, huh? Yeah, they absolutely are. But man, getting those extra resources, I'm sure has been huge. I I'm curious to know, what has been your biggest project so far? And then what was the biggest challenge of that project? Because I imagine that, I mean, there are just so many moving parts to this. So what was the biggest one? And then what was the hardest part about it? Well, biggest is really a subjective metric in, the, in a lot of ways here, because, you know, there's the longest running, the most tree planted, the, the largest well-known disaster in which we've worked potentially. And so I'll give you a few stories, I guess, there briefly. Bastrop, the, our first project, still is the project in which we worked the longest and planted the most trees, because we kept coming back to Bastrop for five years and doing these programs, sometimes more than one of them a year. So I think that really speaks to the, the long-term commitment that we make to communities, which has been repeated in many areas in which we've worked over the years. Um, the current program that we are operating, uh, you know, the Miami Valley Tree Recovery Campaign, that actually is the largest program to date for a couple of reasons. One of them is because of the level of fundraising that we've been able to achieve alongside our partner, the Dayton Foundation, and a whole host of, of giving agencies that have bought into the program. So that's, you know, resultant in the number of trees that we will be able to plant over the course of the life of the program, but then also the expansion of the programmatic offerings to include other pieces of what I've termed the resiliency to recovery continuum. We very quickly realized in doing these plantings that as we come into a community in which there are no trees, there is no environment, essentially, that by planting trees, we're recreating the green infrastructure of the community, which is making it more resilient to future weather events. That's been, you know, how trees do that. Um, that's been very well documented. And there's a whole other podcast I'd be happy to, <laughs> to engage you guys in about how that works and why trees are so essential to that. But when we realized that we were making these communities resilient just by planting the aftermath of, of a disaster in the recovery process, we thought, why not get on the front end of this and make communities more resilient to potential future weather event that they haven't even experienced yet? Um, so that's, you know, one example of that. And then that brought this whole idea of, of the continuum where there's all these different programmatic elements that we can put around the idea of just replanting trees in the aftermath of disaster. And one of those um, that we have been able to implement and execute in, in the Miami Valley specifically is tree debris removal and maintenance work. So that's, you know, after the disaster happens, there's a lot of trees that are really mangled and, and destroyed or uh, you know, just around like tree debris that needs to be removed or trees that need to be assessed. And for a lot of families, they're, they're just not the resources to go out and remove a tree that's, you know, basically standing deadwood and is dangerous for the folks who are living there or remove the tree debris that's, that's been left in the yard. So that became a really important equity piece of our mission as well, understanding that we can't send volunteers in to plant new trees at some of these home sites because they're still experiencing uh, you know, the need or like they're in a they're in a state where they need this debris to be removed or these dangerous trees to be taken down. So we've actually been able to add that that piece onto it, which really has grown the size of the program offerings again. And it's the scope of the program that we're doing in Dayton, since we're both doing a coordinated debris removal uh, process at over 100 home sites and then doing this planting at, uh, you know, five to 600 home sites as well. So that that program in total is going to last you know, two to three years to do all of that work. 
Yeah. So Grady, Sean again here from Richmond. How was how does this process go forward? I mean, obviously there there as you had said, there's environmental disasters happening very regularly. How do you kind of go forward determining where where the need is greatest or where resources can be marshaled or you, or is it kind of waiting to to have folks come to you? I hesitate to use the word waiting because I'm definitely jumping out of my seat. I'm not sitting on my hands over here for sure, but the at the current level and coming into the merger, we really only had the potential to maybe help all of the folks who were directly asking us for help. We certainly didn't have the bandwidth to go into communities and, and offer and, and to sort of explain to them why they would need our help, right? And the main potential result of the merger is to be able to do that, to really become known as what we are, which is the national authority in doing this work and to be able to deliver it through the organizational, the existing organizational infrastructure of Keep America Beautiful. And to have that go from this program, you know, basically a small group operating out of Dallas and doing this across the country to a bunch of different groups who are doing this all across the affiliate network and not just for affiliate communities, but for communities that may not have a Keep America Beautiful affiliate, but who after experiencing this program and our community may want to join us and be a part of the Keep America Beautiful family going forward. So, you know, that work is underway, creating the toolkit, creating the processes where I'm actually currently engaged in development work to fund that process as well and create those tools so that other people can do this. I'm not trying to hold on to some secret formula here that, you know, you can only experience the, the replanting of your community through, through Grady and the retreat program and keep married people. I mean, I, I hesitate to say we'd open source this because you know, I, I don't know exactly how possible that is. There's definitely some support that's needed and there's expertise uh, that, that certainly can help in a lot of these communities. But we're currently building the tools to be able to, I, I believe, geometrically grow this program. It's not just exponentially. It's, it's heading in all different directions. And I would like to see instead of, you know, two, three, four, five retreats, uh, which is the, also the name of, of a you know, specific activation, right? Retreats the program. But when we go to Dayton, it's Dayton retreat. Um, instead of just that number happening every year, which is what I'm able to organize, that we're seeing 20 or 30 or 50 of these because every disaster, when it hits, destroys the trees. And that is something that people who are wondering what it is that they can do to help, that's something that they can do. And they just need to be told that and organized in, into doing it and be given that opportunity and to, you know, to the benefit of everybody involved. So is there, you know, Matt asked about your biggest project, would you say that there's a new project that's too small? I mean, let's say there's a, you know, EF1 tornado or two that comes through and just kind of knocks, you know, knocks, you know, I don't know, a couple half mile trees down or something. Is there anything you think that's too small or is it really just, uh, is it, it's all open to, to being able to uh, come to Keep America Beautiful for this? There's no project that's too small for sure. I mean, but it, it, I, I think the, the question really for me is how is help rendered there? If it's just half a street in some small town and the Western side of whatever state, I don't know that's, you know, I'm, I'm gonna fly out there and bring the whole tool truck and trailer and, and, and do all that. It might, it might be too small for that level of engagement, but it's certainly not too small to mount some kind of response. And, and there's a way that we can do that, again, through our local affiliate network. There's likely a Keep America Beautiful close to whatever community that is. I mean, that's something that we can help inform and potentially push resources towards, or at least be a partner in uh, understanding how resources could be made available and helping the local groups both find what they need to put the planting on based off of our expertise, and then also provide, again, the expertise that we have in terms of once you have what you need, how do you actually get this done? So there, no, there's no program that's too small. Every tree that's been destroyed in a natural disaster needs to be replaced. And quite honestly, we need to be planting a lot more than that as well. Yeah, for sure. Another thing I wanted to ask you, Grady, which I remember this coming up uh, when we heard your talk in, in Wisconsin, as you alluded to, planting a tree isn't just planting a tree, right? You, you've got to have the right ones. You've got to have arborists there. You, you, need, you need a full process. It's not just you go out, you put a tree in the ground and off you go. What are some of the other things that, that the volunteers do to kind of lead up to physically putting trees in the ground? 
Well, that really depends on what level of volunteer engagement we're talking about there. The, the volunteers that would travel into a community and when we have, or typically when we host one of these events, wherever that is, there's a certain number of volunteers who are coming from all across the country to be a part of this, who've been exposed to our program and our organization, some for many years, uh, who have had many opportunities to come and do this. And it's, it's become part of their DNA, part of their identity, the way they see themselves. Those volunteers coming in will help with the organization of the program itself in the days leading up to that. We're talking, you know, delivering the trees to home sites, helping set up whatever the celebratory venue is, going to the store and buying snacks for all the other volunteers that are going to show up the next day. There's a whole laundry list of things that, that we need to do. And absent having a very robust uh, staff, you know, to take care of all those needs, we figure out and, and have figured out ways to engage the, the sort of loyal volunteer body, the folks who are coming in that want to help put on the production itself. So that's that's what volunteers of that nature are doing. But on planting day, most volunteers really are just showing up in the morning to be taught how to properly plant trees, uh, you know, and then broken up into these these groups, which we really try to mix people up. We don't want just people coming and going with the friend group that they brought. We want to break them up and introduce them to new folks and spread, you know, the people who've come from out of town around and break up the, the Home Depot volunteers who've shown up and put a few of them in each group so that we create, you know, a diverse and you know, a, a exciting group of people um, that goes out and has this experience together and, and friendships really are formed over that. I've, I've seen many of them occur that have lasted for years. And then also it really, I don't know how to describe the moment, what it feels like to be at a celebratory dinner with these, these residents where you've had 200 trees that have gone in the ground that day. Everybody's eating an amazing meal. They're listening to some live music and they're sharing the stories of all the interactions that they had that day. And, and they know that all of those stories in that moment is really calcified by these trees that have been put in the ground. And for the rest of their lives, they can come back to this community or if a resident that lives in the community, they're gonna see those trees you know, grow and get bigger and bigger and bigger. And when you plant a tree in front of someone's house like that, every day they walk out of their front door, they're gonna think about you. And I know that's true because we keep in touch with a lot of these residents and they send us emails for years later, you know, following these plantings about how they're still thinking about us. So they send us letters because it's a physical symbol that grows. And I think that's something when people question the concept of, you know, disaster relief and wanting to do something that seemingly maybe is less trivial in their mind or more important. I'm not here to tell you that it's not important to come in and, and, you know, give people food and blankets and stabilize that situation. And that's, I mean, that is clearly extremely important and a great way to help. But when you do that, that, those are things that have momentary significance. You know, a, a meal is consumed, a blanket is used. Nobody's using their Red Cross blanket 10 years later in, in their rebuilt home. But they are walking out of their front door, as I was saying, and seeing that tree. And when you take your time and you put your energy and your love, you know, into digging a hole, which it's a lot harder to plant a tree, especially a 15-gallon tree, than people think. And there's a lot of ways to do it wrong. You know, I think most people who would think they know how to plant trees, uh, probably couldn't talk to me about, you know, addressing girdling roots, which is something you need to do with every tree you plant, finding the root flare, making sure the tree wasn't planted or is, you know, isn't buried too deep in the pot, understanding how wide the hole needs to be. There's a lot of things there that are basic, but that we teach. Um, and, and that also has ripple effects as all these volunteers, you know, thousands that we've interacted with now go out among the world and they're out there explaining to other people how to plant trees properly. And I also know that's that's the case because every now and then I receive some excited text message from a former or, or you know, still a volunteer who ran to someone at a gas station with a bunch of trees in the back of their truck and wound up getting in a big conversation with them about their trees and, you know, winds up in the situation where they're like explaining all the the steps to properly planting and the person is, is taking notes on their phone and how how gratifying it is to have that knowledge and spread it. So I know there are so many more effects to what we're doing outside of just planting the trees that day. Yeah, you know, I never thought about it, but what a big role this probably plays in the healing process. You know, when you're getting that community back to the way it looked before that disaster, that just goes such a long way in lifting the spirits. But the other thing I love about this project is how it can benefit climate change because trees are such an important part of fighting climate change getting the carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere is our best tool for that is those trees. And so what really, you know, breaks my heart is all these wildfires that we see in the Western US. And just you hear about these terrible numbers, the thousands of acres that are burned. 
how do you go about addressing a situation like that when you have one of these massive wildfires that occurs in the West? How do you go about replanting and dealing with a situation like that? Is that something that's on the table for y'all going forward? I know you've kind of been dealing with these wind events and storm events, but could you be ever see yourself or have you already maybe at a smaller scale dealt with a wildfire situation where you just these huge numbers of trees are taken out in just a matter of days? When we did the planting in Bastrop, that actually was in the aftermath of, of a wildfire, very devastating one, burned about 34,000 acres and over 1,600 homes. So the first event we ever did uh, was in the aftermath of wildfires. Now, we are specifically focusing on replanting trees at home sites, not large scale public land or uh, reforestation effort, so to speak, that uh, along the lines of what you would be describing. I think oftentimes, uh, really the best thing that we can do for the forest is to leave it alone and let it regrow itself. You know, things like this happen, fires come through and burn. This is a very unfortunate reality in which we live and we're made more aware of it by climate change and also by human encroachment into these areas uh, where structures are lost. Again, you mentioned the idea of healing and it is an incredibly important piece of the healing process for a community. There's a lot of research out there that's really fascinating about how folks who are recuperating following surgery, if they have a, a window in their, in their room and they can see trees out the window, they require less medication and they heal faster. You know, and it, it's also well documented in, in places like Japan, they prescribe forest baths, you know, for people who are experiencing elevated stress levels. These are concepts that we are familiar with. So if you push that out and say, oh, if, if, if taking a forest bath helps an individual reduce their stress level, just imagine the stress that a community the aftermath of a natural disaster is feeling. And therefore what it would mean to come in at a time when they've largely been forgotten, you know, a year or two, again, three years later, there are very few other volunteer groups at that point operating in the space and helping. And so when we come in with this, you know, this joyous train of tree planting volunteers and we put in this green blanket um, and again, express that care. It's twofold, just feeling that they've not been forgotten, that someone's here and organized this and cares enough about them to do it, really lifts spirits, but then also planting these trees does as well. And I, I know I've referenced many times all of the communication that I've received over the years, but it's, you know, I get pictures of people showing me the bird that has alighted in their new tree and, and the little nest and the little chicks that are you know looking for food and just how much joy and excitement it gives them to see that and to know that it's going to feel like home again we talk about that a lot we want to make it feel like home again everyone under, you know, understands that concept well what makes it feel like home again emotionally is having living things come back into the community and that's a specific need that we're addressing and again focus mostly on urban and semi-urban areas not the the large-scale public land reforestation I think there is a role that we have to play in that, but that is not that that program or that concept specifically is not what the retreat program is focused on at this time. Brady, one more question, just uh, you know, about you said you're trying to help people feel like they're at home again. So my my question with this is, will you plant trees specific to each region? So say there is a uh, you know a, a hurricane that comes through and it mainly just knocks out a bunch of palm trees. Will you guys come out and actually re? plant palm trees versus just an oak tree that you might see somewhere in Texas? Oh, it's so much more specific than that, actually. Um, so not only, I'll, I'll give you an example. When we planted in the aftermath of Hurricane Harvey in Port Aransas and Rockport, which are still active program areas, and I'm trying to raise funds to return, we were working in those areas before COVID happened and we're looking to go back. But when we were looking uh, at which trees we were going to plant there, thinking of the equation of retreat, when we find the list of trees that should be planted in any area, that's something that a local partner is going to give us. We don't come in and make those determinations. There's some group there, typically the local chapter of the International Society of Arboriculture, the local urban foresters, the, matru in, the master naturalists. They've been doing that research for 40, 50, 100 years. What are the best trees to plant in this area? And so we lean on them to give us what we call the approved species list. And then we source those from reputable wholesale nurseries, local to the area, and those are also ones that have established a reputation over the years among our local partners and come highly recommended to us. So we know which trees we should plant, and we know where they should come from. But in, in the aftermath of Hurricane Harvey, not only were we saying, okay, we're gonna make sure we're planting, in this case, you know, live oaks, for example, which were very heavily along 
the barrier islands of, of Texas and really all across the, the Gulf of Mexico area. Not only are we going to focus on like native species, not just plant whatever we feel like should go down there, certainly not shipping trees across the country or bringing, you know, blue spruces or whatever from Colorado to plant there. But we did soil sample testing to see if the pH level of the soil had been changed by all of the, the you know, the ocean water that had washed ashore in that community. We thought about the migratory bird populations because Port Aransas is specifically well known to be, uh, you know, a, a, on the migratory bird route, they have a whooping crane festival every year. There's, there, you know, that's part of their tourism industry, and that was also badly damaged. So when we were making those decisions about what trees we should plant off of that approved species list, we were thinking, what kind of bird populations are these going to feed? What trees are going to do best in an elevated um, saline soil in which they're going to be planted? We're taking a lot of things into consideration that then also get down to the specifics of the site itself. How big of a tree can fit here? How close is it to this, that, or the other? What purpose do we want it to serve? And we always have a list of, you know, four or five trees that are available. Everything from, you know, small flowering ornamental that can be planted in an area where it's not going to get any bigger than 10 feet to your large shade trees to evergreen trees and shrubs that can provide some kind of privacy, potentially. And those are all decisions that, again, are made in tandem with the family, with an arborist who's visiting the property, understanding where everything is placed, including the utility lines above and below, so that they can make, ideally, decisions that will result in a more healthy and vibrant urban forest in the aftermath of the disaster than there even was before that. And that's, again, when we're planting these trees, we're not just thinking about the day they're going to the ground. We're thinking about 50 years from now and what this is going to look like and how this urban forest is going to serve the community. Awesome. Well, Grady, thanks so much for joining us today. It was it's great to hear you talk. Like I said, we all really enjoyed your speech when we uh, when we saw you in Milwaukee um, at the AMS conference. And so it was good to kind of dive a little bit deeper with you today. So I appreciate you taking the time. It's absolutely my pleasure. All right. Well, stay with us after the break. Uh, Sean, Matt and myself will be back. All right, welcome back to Across the Sky podcast. I'm Kirsten Lang, Tulsa World Meteorologist, again, joined with Sean Sublett with the Richmond Times-Dispatch and Matt Holliner up in uh, the Chicago area. And uh, guys, Grady was a great, great uh, guest to have on today. And we just said, man, he's just a wealth of information. Uh, and he's so passionate too, which is, it's it's awesome to talk about somebody that that loves their job as much as he seems to. Yeah, there's so much that he has, has done. And, you know, there's so much logistical work that needs to be done in, in addition to the physical work of, of, of putting trees in the ground, but trying to get the right trees or the right people, uh, coordinating with, with larger providers, local providers as well, uh, being ready with those resources, every bit as important as the actually putting the trees physically in the ground. So I think that's just tremendous, tremendous work that he's doing. Yeah, you can tell he's real passionate about what what he does, especially when he talks about the impact that it has on the communities, you know, and after they plant all the trees, the conversations that happen afterwards and kind of the celebration that they have, because that's what it occurred to me, you know, when you see the images that and that's kind of usually where the headlines end. we see all the images of the destruction, you know, and you see the follow up maybe for a couple of weeks, but you don't really see what it looks like a year later, two years later, you know, the, the news media goes away but the people that are there are stuck with those images for days and weeks and months and so i can just imagine you know when an area that just gets absolutely devastated whether it's a hurricane or a big tornado that comes through you know not only to repair the buildings that were damaged but the, the native landscape to see it at least partially restored i know at first it may not be back to the way it is because you might be planting some young trees that need to grow but I can just imagine that that just goes such a long way for folks, you know, who are really hurting after these events, just to, it's one step closer back to normalcy, you know, for them. And I, I can imagine that it's a really rewarding work. So it doesn't surprise me that he's as, as passionate about it as he is. Yeah. And we're going to have to have him on again, too, as we were discussing, just to talk about how the impacts of that, uh, even, even on climate and how, and, and how, you know, trees, uh, tree canopies, how they just, they provide so much more to us than just looking pretty, right? Uh, there's just a lot more that goes on with that. 
Uh, so we'll have to we'll have to have him back on uh, if he'll take us at, at a later date. So, uh, you know, it's been it's been a good week. This was fun. I, we didn't really get to do a lot of uh, catch up at the beginning, but, you know, hopefully you guys are having a great week. And uh, Matt, everything going good there in, in Chicago? Uh, enjoying the the cooler temperatures for now, because I'm looking at the uh, the long range forecast once we get beyond the weekend, especially. And uh, it's not looking good. <laughs> especially in some some places more than others like nebraska oh my goodness there, there's some models that are kicking out some crazy hot temperatures so i think everybody right now looking ahead to that is like let's enjoy the below normal temperatures that we're getting across much of the midwest for now because that's about to change in a big way and it's back to the scorch mm -hmm. yeah. john how we're, are you faring we're doing okay i mean the today is our 11th or 12, I think, no, 12th consecutive day at 90 degrees or, or greater. Uh, our normal highs are in the upper 80s. So that, you know, that sounds bad, but it's not, it's not wildly atypical uh, for this time of the year. We'll get some thunderstorms Friday, but right now we're very optimistic. We get an actual front that goes through on Friday uh, and it stays in Carolina for like a day. So we'll get a nice break in humidity and temperatures in the 80s, conveniently on a Saturday, which I think will be welcome news. Uh, for all of us. But, you know, the other thing, uh, we're going into August soon, which means hurricane season is really going to start to ramp up. And I know that, you know, June, July, typically we don't get that much anyway. Uh, but just to, to keep this in the back of your mind, next week, we're going to bring in Warren Madden, who's retired Air Force, who used to fly up in Hurricane Recon, one of the hurricane hunters. Uh, so as we get into the teeth of hurricane season, we're going to talk about what it is like to be up in that plane and flying into a hurricane. So that's coming up uh, with my buddy Warren Madden uh, from, for, from the Air Force next week. And he's still working as a civilian contractor there, uh, I believe at the National Hurricane Center. Yeah, I can't wait for that because I'm gonna try and decide if that's really something I wanna do or not. Cause I keep wavering. Some part of me is like, I absolutely wanna be getting one of those planes to do it. But the other part of me is like, mm -mm, you know, maybe not, maybe, maybe it's a little <laughs> too, too, too exciting. So I'm hoping that he might <laughs> he'll he'll swing me one way or the other because I certainly find it fascinating. Yeah, I'm really looking forward to his stories. I can barely sit in the back seat of a car, okay? So I probably won't be ever going <laughs> up with Hurricane Hunter without getting sick. So. <laughs> All right, guys. Well, it's been a wonderful week. Thank you so much for joining us with the Across the Sky podcast. We will catch you next week. Learning to swim is fun. British Swim School is welcoming all new students to start their journey in the world of water. The team of highly trained experts at British Swim School will show your little fish all the ins and outs of life in the water, while also sharing valuable knowledge on water safety. So is it time for your kids to get their feet wet? Sign them up now at BritishSwimSchool.com. That's BritishSwimSchool.com. British Swim School. Make a splash.